everybody. Welcome to the Big Dog Podcast. I'm so excited. Uh, we got a little different format coming at you today. We're making use of some new software, which actually my buddy here, Jeff Janakovo, introduced us to. And uh, when I had the privilege a couple months ago to be on his podcast, great podcast. If you don't already follow it, you need to check out The Big Ticket Life on all platforms. Um, it's a tremendous show that Jeff does weekly. Uh, with the live stream and then of course post on you know Spotify and you know Apple podcast and and whatnot as well but Jeff is an entrepreneur his his tagline he does business in your bedroom and I'll let him break into that <laughs> a little further for us but he owns operates one of the premier uh, mattress businesses uh, in the region um, he is an author he is a consultant he is a coach he is a dad a husband a friend he's a he's an all-around great guy we met in january of this year and um, fellow apex brother we met in january in dallas and we hit it off like yep. right away just just clicked and i knew very quickly this is somebody that um I'm now going to be doing life with. And so it took a little while to to get him on the the show here, but I'm really excited, you know, how it planned out. And we took the planning away from it. Boom. It just happened. And so this was the right day, the right time for the right conversation. So Jeff, welcome to the big dog podcast, brother. Hey, uh, that's a hell of an intro. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, a lot of apex folks throw that saying around doing life together. And it really does mean something. You know, um, I love the fact we're connected and that yeah. I can call you a friend and I can call everybody else friends and, you know, developing these relationships. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I know for me, you need to look no further for evidence of that than you look in your social media feeds. And it's just, you know, we got wins for days. Apex puts a week on it. Yeah. And uh, the, the reality is when you change who you're connected to, you change your life. And uh, that is real stuff. 100%. That's awesome. So Jeff, tell us a little bit about you. Who's Jeff? You know, tell us about family and, and your business yeah. and how you ended up in the business of people's bedrooms. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I use that tag because it's so much, it's, it gets so much more attention than to say it like a networking event or, you know, going into a room for the first time. Yeah. I'm a mattress guy. I sell mattresses. So, uh, but you know, I do, I do business in your bedroom and that, that actually came up because I was talking with our team about the importance and, and who we are in our customers' lives, because we go into people's personal private bedrooms and if you're watching, if you're listening to this, I want you to think about the last time that you had friends and family. I'm not talking about people you don't know. I'm talking about right. people you trust. Like they have a key to your house. Maybe they, you know, maybe they come over and let your dog out when you're on vacation, right? When was the last time they were in your bedroom? And the answer for most people is like, that doesn't happen because it's right. my personal private space, right? Well, my business, here comes two guys on a truck and we present well, we got the look, we got the uniforms, we got the booties, we lay out the red carpet, all the sure. stuff is there. But the fact remains, we're still going into your bedroom. And it came from talking with my team to say, look, we do business in people's bedrooms and we need to respect that. We need to respect the power of what we do, how we can impact their life through better sleep. And then my delivery team, we need to respect the fact of where we are in somebody's house. Right. And, and that's where that came from. So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a funny saying it's tongue in cheek. We do business in your bedroom. You know, my, my, my personal email is, uh, is somewhat related, uh, somewhat tongue in cheek. Uh, I'm not going to throw it out. Nor, you can, uh, I'm sure in the show notes, you can go to the Jeff G and connect with me any number of ways there, but my personal email is just as tongue in cheek and it gets a good laugh whenever I use it. Um, That's awesome. Typically the people look at me across the desk kind of funny. And then I, <laughs> then I drop it while well, I'm a mattress guy. Yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> yep. Yep. That's awesome. That's awesome. So tell us a little bit about family. You're married, just had a son graduate recently. Yeah. Yeah. We're celebrating. I think you're celebrating a 20 years this year too. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. We just I did a um, week ago. Yep. Yeah. So married to my wife, Stephanie, um, 20 years. Uh, I got two boys, 18 year old Ethan and uh 14 year old Aiden. That's and, awesome. uh, yeah, it's cool to see him grow up. It's, you know, I, I always was like, man, it'd be, you know, cause we had kids young. My wife has MS. We got married young. We started young. Um, 
we started the family young because of due to her health, you know, we didn't, she didn't want to, she didn't want to go through um, pregnancy and in early years of having children, right, if her disease had advanced. And, you know, so we started young, and I always kind of was like, looking for this time where our boys got older, could be a little more self sufficient, and man, I just want them back home now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I had, I had to say, look, Sundays, every Sunday, four o'clock on that is, that is built in family time from here on out. Yeah. And I want to keep that as a, as a going thing as you guys get older. Uh, yeah. Cause they're both, you know, they're both working. Uh, well, Ethan's transitioning into the workforce, but he's got his own hustle with law, cutting lawns and walking yeah, dogs. That. And yep. So um, he's, do, he's busy with that. And he's transitioning into the workforce full time. The younger one, he's working part time at Chick Fil A, and you know he's doing his own grass, cutting grass. So they're busy, and yeah. keeping them around now is like now that's what I want. So it's weird, right? So my son just turns well; he'll be eighteen in December. He's go he's going into his senior year. Um, Kirsten just turned fifteen in May, so we're kind of yep. in that same. We're in that same age, block. Yep. You know, and you know, a year and a half ago, my son got his driver's license and mm-hmm. it was boom, like this dude's gone. Yeah. He, yep. he, now he does spend a lot of time around the house and his girlfriend like to hang out at the house, which, which I love that. And my daughter and her friends will hang out. And, and that means the world to me, um, that, that they choose our place to hang out at. Yep. But they're gone. A lot. I've, yeah. yeah I, we, 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 we built our home around, being the house where the kids would hang out yeah you know so earlier years trampoline in the backyard you know we were fortunate to live right across from a baseball soccer field nice uh got a the movie theater was very intentional in the basement for that reason yep you know the video they were okay buying the newest console because our kids are around and their friends are around yep so we know where our kids are yeah i get it man because that's scary i mean it's scary like it's i could not imagine I just, I could not imagine being 15, 16, 17, 18 years old right now. I mean, I guess I can't imagine it because I see it with my son and my daughter, but they only give me a glimpse into the crap that they're exposed to and hear about and see. And they have a lot of conversations with us, but I also know that they're looking out for me because they know I'm going to go nuts. So if they tell me probably half Mm -hmm. the stuff that's coming about, but it is an interesting stage for them to be in. We do Sunday supper is what we call it every Sunday. Nice. You know, yep. the kids are at the house. Um, my mother, my grandmother, we've been doing this now for, gosh, probably going on five years. Um, it wasn't always a priority to me. And you know, about five years ago, we just had some stuff going on in the family. I'm like, you know what? This is crazy. Every Sunday, like it's yep. dinner at our house. And it's an open invite. Anybody can come. We have staff come by sometimes. Other friends stop by sometimes. Nice. Uh, I'm just cooking as if the world's showing up. And sometimes it's just six of us or seven of us. Uh, Right. And it's great. But that is a guaranteed, if someone needs a spot to be, Sunday afternoons, the Wilson's house, like, you're welcome. It's it's an it's an open door. I'm coming down. You're yeah, not come all on, that brother. Far come on. <laughs> You're just a couple hours up the road, so it's fine. Jump on the. I've, um, I've been to uh, I've been to Virginia Beach. Razor? Is that what you just got? Oh, I got a Polaris slingshot. The yeah, slingshot. That, yeah, yeah, that thing is just, it, you know, it, it's it's illegal fun. It's <laughs> is what that thing is. I mean, well, you had a, a motorcycle for years. I did, man. I, I could ride a motorcycle before I could ride a bicycle. Well, dirt bike. So I was on two wheels, like at the age of three. Grew up as a farm kid in, in you know, central Ontario in Canada. Moved here when I was 11. But, you know, riding little dirt bikes around the farm, four-wheelers, golf carts, you know. Um, farmers have all the fun toys. But uh, right. I had a motorcycle really since 18. You know, had an accident, had a big one, kept riding. And this this summer, I noticed myself early, well, this spring, because we're still in summer, but I noticed myself being overly defensive, overly right. apprehensive for others around me. Yeah. And that's a scary place. I mean, it's it's kind of appropriate in the business world, right? Like if you get if you get a little too insular, let that voice start talking to you, yep. control you a little bit, you start making bad decisions or no decisions or delayed decisions, and then yep. all of a sudden your business is out of control. So riding for me has always been 
my accident was about the second, the second I stopped driving for the other person, that's when I had the accident. Yep. You know, I thought they saw me, I rolled on, bang, done. And, uh, and then, uh, that, you know, that taught me a lot. And this spring, I'm just like, this is becoming weird for me now. And then, oh, okay. yeah, I, I need, I, I bet I've had a, I've had a rough life body wise. So my right hip's pretty shot. So getting my, and my left leg is shot from the accident from football and, and some construction years. Uh, yeah. so for me, like getting my right leg down, I have to plant with my right leg. I couldn't, I was, it was harder and harder on longer rides to get it down in time. I actually dropped the bike twice this spring. Oh, wow. Coming okay. to a stop. I, I did the bicycle Biden. <laughs> Just couldn't get the like, foot down quick enough, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like literally that's what it was. Like the brain was talking, but the, the legs weren't moving. And uh, so you're like, and, it's you know, time to move on to something different. It is. Yeah, it was time. And you're having yeah. a blast in the slingshot. Dude, I told Steph driving at home, I said, I want you to recall, I haven't had a speeding ticket in Pennsylvania. And I clarified it that way because like speeding tickets in Maryland don't transfer to your license. Right. Yeah. So that just it doesn't matter. It's an $80 fine or whatever. It's small dollars. And um it's not riding on your insurance for like three years. But I, I just reminded her, it's been like 15 years since I had a speeding ticket. I'm probably <laughs> going to get one of this. <laughs> so That's good. That's good. Well, man, look, talk to me about um you know, some of your passions, I mean, you're an avid outdoorsman. Um, you love know, being you, at my campsite. You got your campsite. I love seeing mm -hmm. the stuff on social media. You're out there with the family, sometimes just yourself, um, just taking it easy, enjoying it. You're, one of my favorite posts I see you do is, you know, this morning's office view, and it's like a cup of coffee just sitting on the deck, you know, at yep. the campsite, fire going. And it's awesome because, like, that's the happy spot, and that's something yep. that you enjoy doing. Um and I always find it great where you and I are very similar as are a lot of people that we know we are um, out there. We're with people. We're communicating and engaging nonstop all the time. But also there's that part of all of us where we could be perfectly fine solo. Just, oh, yeah. need, just need that period of time, right? Just to, to kind yeah. of regroup and re-energize. Um, you know, and it, it's always interesting to me when I see these the parallels between two very different passions because one of your other passions and, and something that's very important to you is helping business owners, entrepreneurs transition from the tactical, I'm the plumber doing yep. the plumbing to that investor level at the top where they're no yep. longer you know in the dirt. They're no longer dealing with, you know, staff and recruiting and hiring and payroll and all those things. So it kind of talked to me a little bit about that. How do you not balance? I'm not a big balance guy, but how do you well, chase and uh, balance is, is bounce, a fool's bounce around between, you know, the things that keep you motivated and energized and what are you doing in your world to work towards what's most important to you? Like, is that the, the coaching consulting piece? Is that the growing, the, the, the mattress businesses, you know, what, yep. What's that part for you that you're driving towards? Yeah. So for me, I mean, I'll kind of start where this little chunk picked up about the campsite. I think business owners, first and foremost, need to be intentional about what they need to be a full uh, leader, right? Like, you know, there's, there's sayings, we say it a lot, pour into other people. Well, if your glass ain't full, you ain't pouring anything into anybody. Yeah. A lot of times people's glasses are empty or they got a hole in the bottom of the cup. Yeah. <laughs> So if you're not intentional about a space that like invigorates you, for me, it's the campsite, you know, for other people, you, you decide, and that's the beauty of it, right? Like you pick, but create it by intention and, and build it into your life. Like for me, I can roll up there and, um, uh, get up there midweek, have a meal. Like I'm open cooking in like 10 minutes Yeah, that's great. if I need to be. And then spend the day, my days when I'm up there alone, I'm like working, I'm planning, but it's like real high level thought. Yeah. Because that's the environment that fosters it. Right. So I think a lot of business people forget to do things like that. And they get into that tactical aspect, like Joe Plummer, just turning wrenches, right. Trading time for dollars. And, you know, a lot of people walk around like, Hey, I'm, I'm unemployable. Like they wear that 
as a badge on their chest, right? Yeah. And they run these businesses because they've got a better level of skill. They can sell, you know, they can talk to people, but they just, they don't understand the higher level tactics of you are not here to trade your time, which is your, your most valuable asset for the dollars people give you in an hour. You're here to yeah. build a legacy. So for me, to, to answer the last question you asked, and then I'll fill it in, where I'm going, my goal, I want to own a kick-ass camping site out in the Mountain West. Uh, I want to live there in the nice months. I want to pull out our kick-ass fifth wheel and a big old F-350, M- maybe not Ford. Ford's jacking me around right now with my current uh-huh. truck, so... So I know you're a TRX guy, so maybe it'll be like a Dodge Cummins diesel or something. Well, look, man, I'm actually, I'm a big time Ford guy. The TRX just got my attention so much. Um, I know. I had I know. to go it's for it. It's my I'm, name too. My son has an F-150 and I honestly, this is going to sound crazy. People are going to think I'm an idiot, but I kind of enjoy his Larry at F-150 more than the TRX. The yeah. TRX is just like, ah, you know, the whole damn time that you're going. Whereas right. I get the F-150 and it's luxurious, but it's just running through walls nonstop. Yeah. The F-150 just, you know, let me go do my old man drive and chill. <laughs> <laughs> but so, any, whatever, yeah, but, whatever pulls it, you know, whatever pulls it, pulls right. it. Um, and I want that camping site. Cause I really like, I think family should be the greatest thing we do. Greatest thing anybody does. I think if you talk to anybody that had a positive experience camping as a kid, it's a foundational memory for them. Sure. And oftentimes it carried on. Oftentimes, you know, they continue to do it or maybe they don't do it because dad's passed away, but it's so important to them. So for me, and I love that business because by and large, you're investing in the asset once. So really what you're doing is you are selling time. Yeah. You know, like my current business, you know, Right now, a retail mattress business, like so much of what you sell is inventory. Mm -hmm. And a big chunk of the profit dollars left over is payroll and rent and lights and things like that. So I like the camping business for that. Plus, I'm passionate about it. Plus, I believe it really fosters the greatest thing we do, which is family and memories. Yeah. And I envision bringing in the community. Like, I don't want to be middle of nowhere. I want to be in a place where there's a community around where on Friday nights, it's community night. Like, we, I'm going to build a grass amphitheater where you can sit out and pitch tents and watch a movie as a family and then camp the night. That's cool. If you want to rent a cabin, you can come and it's not going to be a pain in the ass. Like we'll have the dishes there and the sheets. Right. But I want you to get a taste. So you fall in love with it. And then you got to do the work of camping. Right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But, but I want you, I want, that's the environment that I want to build for people and have it be really something special. And then, the, you know, the winter months when it's tough on my wife, we'll go chase nice weather in our camper and we'll have a manager there that can run it. They'll, they'll run it all, all year round. Sure. But, uh, but that's where I'm going uh, with it. That's cool. And to, you know, to get there, big ticket life, working with other businesses. And, it, and it, it's funny, I got real absolute clarity on this at my campsite, Memorial Day Monday. And it was, I decided I'm going to work with people that, are going to allow me in in an important way in their business, whether that's through a significant investment or an equity position. And wouldn't you know it, I got that first deal the Thursday after. Isn't that crazy when you speak stuff out? Yep. Yeah, you have to do it. You can't keep it in your head. It's just not real. Yeah. Because the crap in your head, even high performers, is is louder than, than what you really want. Oh, for no doubt. I mean, and that's everybody. Um, you know, when yeah, I think about that and I and I talk to to friends and colleagues all the time. It's like, what do you want? What do you want? What are the things that scare the crap out of you that you keep to yourself all only? And you don't tell anybody. Because that other part of you, like you said, those voices in your head, that's what's they're they're keeping you from sharing. They're having that argument why you shouldn't speak it out loud. And then before you even get started, you've got no chance whatsoever because you're talking yourself out of it and before it's even more of a, before it's even spoken to life. But once you speak it out to somebody, yep, it, 
it something changes. And honestly, I believe you don't even necessarily have to speak it out to someone. You can just verbalize it. And the way you hear it externally is different from when it's a yep. voice in your head. Yeah. And now it's like, this is possible. There's, there's potential here. And the universe hears it. The universe picks up on it. Yep. And all of a sudden, here's this opportunity. Now, all of a sudden, yeah. oh, there's this relationship that's coming about that has been here for 9, 10, 12 months, 18 months. Oh, wait, you, you do that? You're connected to so-and-so? Yep. And it, it's been there the whole time. Yep. You just didn't ask for it. Exactly. And, you know, what, what came to be four days later, people might be listening to this, rolling their eyes, disbelief, oh, yeah, right, just saying that for the show. No, I mean, it really happened. And now I've got one more document to sign and I can publish it and it'll all be up on their site uh, for, for the position I'm in and what I'm doing and how I'm contributing. But uh, it happened because I was doing the work. I, I produced in the Big Ticket Life show for, for six months prior. Yeah. And, and they were watching. And I was contributing in another group and they were watching. And so when you, when, when people are watching and then you're right, you speak it out. And I just said, I did this, I did just that. I said, that's it. <laughs> I can't be worried about people that are worried about investing 200 bucks a month or 500 bucks a month. And those aren't even on my fees, just numbers right. I'm putting out, but I can't be worried about people investing little dollars a month and unwilling to change. I need to be working with people that are excited for change and value what I can bring to them and are excited about the goal we envision together. Sure. And that's what I said. And then four days later, there it comes. So talk and, a little bit to people about that process of getting to that point where you're speaking this out, you're getting clarity. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we met in January, uh, mm -hmm. you know, through apex, you know, high level group that, you know, that people hear a lot about on on this podcast. I know that you've had a lot of our our friends on yep. you know, Big Ticket Life as well, um, and you're a part of other groups. Um, how important have these other groups and associations that you have um, with high level performers, people, other business owners, coaches, consultants, personal coaches for you? What type of role did did those types of groups and people play in ultimately you get into that process where you're like, this is what I need to be doing. This is who my time needs to be spent with. Was there yeah. a, a part that they played in that? Well, absolutely. I mean, Sammy Knight, you know, at, at I think it was the November Apex event, which is what made me decide to ro roll up to executives level. Um, you know, he said right on stage, he's like, what do you want? And whatever that want is, um, go get it. And I just decided I, I've done coaching and I've had I've had an income related to coaching consulting for, I don't know, whatever 2014 is the 2022, eight years now. Sure. That's what it is. Eight years. Uh, it actually, yeah, eight years this November um, when we started that business and it's evolved. And now it's like a thing I talk about four times a year and, uh, it, it's evolved into more of a licensing organization and software as a solution. And I'm not the software guy. I'm the architect guy. In that. Right. And, um, but all of these groups, I see what people are doing and I see them intentionally going after the exact business that they want. And that's okay. Like, look, if you want to be a coach that works with people on a month to month basis or a year long contract, that's fine. That doesn't work for that vision that I just laid out of that campsite in, right. in five, six years from now. It doesn't work because I'm not going to, I can't be driving down the road in October, you know, leaving the mountains of Montana, so to say, or September worried about, oh crap, if we don't get new clients this month, uh, we have to like park and maybe I got to work somewhere or right. maybe yeah. I got to fire that manager and we got to stay the winter, right? Like, can't do that. I don't want to do that. So for me, it's it's about building the business now for the intention that I want later. And and what are, what are those clients and relationships and really relationships that are going to foster and support that? Nice. So all of these groups, all of these people that we're connected to and that I listen to and the people that are in groups that you're not in, Josh, like 
it's all important because we can't success is not created in a vacuum. Mm -mm. Uh, it's created with a ton of influence and yeah. input. Hundred percent, hundred percent, and vulnerability. Mm -hmm. You know, and willing to. Um, I think it's really hard when people first get into different types of groups. Um, you know, around different people. Uh, we talk about often that imposter syndrome, and I'm not. I don't have value to add. So you know, there's there's those people that are always kind of back and quiet, and just are they observing? Or are we terrified? Well, all of us at some point are terrified. <laughs> Everybody. Right. I don't care who you are. You know, I, I don't care how cool you are, how successful you are, um, you know, how much you've accomplished. It, it doesn't matter. When, when you walk into these rooms for the first time, until you get a vibe for the, the people that are there and what's going on, it's intimidating. It's intimidating. Mm -hmm. But the real power of uh, coaching, of consulting, of these networking opportunities is when people share is when people talk when they just are super authentic and and open um because you find out while there's a million different industries and businesses that people are in there's millions of different experiences that people have been through and wins and losses and failures and catastrophes and personal failures and personal wins all this stuff through these conversations while everybody's looking around these rooms, oh my gosh, everyone's so different. We're all very much the same. Oh yeah. Your details are just a little different. Right. But you were still broken. There was still pain. You still persevered. You still kept moving forward one step at a time. And it's, it's through those conversations where the power comes because there's trust there. Groups that fail, that try to mimic uh, successful groups, mm -hmm. everyone's sitting around bullshitting. Yep, they're just Black highlight reel in each other, yeah. and it, it's it like you're competing. The ones that are successful though and powerful are super vulnerable. Yep, and 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 that creates that environment where it's like, hey, I. I can help them. I went through something similar with, with my wife. Yeah. You know, and I had a similar struggle with, with, with my, with my son. I don't, I don't know exactly your situation, but man, this is what I dealt with. It's like, Oh shit. Yeah. Josh is not a perfect dad. That's pretty messed up. <laughs> you know, right. That's okay. He, he, that happened with, with his marriage. Oh, there was some dishonesties there. Hey, there was a, a moral failure there that, okay. These people are human like me. Mm -hmm. I can share now. Oh shit. Now we're helping each other and everyone's moving so much further. And one of the things you, you talked about when we opened was when you look at your social media and how it's just filled with wins, it right? Truly is. And, and that's wonderful. But the thing that makes that even more wonderful is through the relationships that are built while we see these wins that they're sharing publicly, we also know about all the L's that mm -hmm. they shared with us inside right. of that room, right? Well, and, and they also share those, some of those L's get shared publicly too. They do. They do. Because they're strong people, you know, uh, strong leaders who realize there's value in that lesson. And yeah. they paid for that lesson, but if they can share that hard lesson learned with others, yeah, so they don't repeat it, that's true leadership. Yeah, And I see stuff like that too. You know, talking about groups, um, you know, there were there was a little dust up in the at the at the entourage level. I, I picked up on a week or so ago. You know, somebody was upset. They didn't get result. They didn't do the work. It was everybody else's fault. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, that was sad because we all know the success recipe is there. Yeah, it's all laid out, and it's been repeated time and again. And what? Ryan Stuman's created, and I've swam around in a lot of ponds, a lot of groups, yeah, with a lot of successful people. But I can tell you, I've seen nothing like what's been created with our community, and it is our community. Mm -hmm. And so, when someone uh, 
chooses to, you know, swing fists in that community because they didn't do the work. Not only is it like, whoa, you're calling, you know, you're calling my family ugly. You're choosing violence here, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> to me, I take it as almost an insult to the work that I do, the yep. work that you do, Josh, the work that everybody else does, because, well, wait a minute, we did that work and it worked for us. Like, you, in a way, I take it as you're insulting my efforts. Yeah. Is the way I look at it. Now, maybe that's yeah. a little backwards. I don't know. But to me, it's like, this is our thing. And I, I believe it's our thing. And I'm invested as though I own the company. Sure. So I don't like when people come swinging fists at that. And, and I'll, I'll compare it to another group, another pond that I swam in. Um, Dan Kennedy, Bill Glazer, GKIC, you know, big time direct response marketing guys. You know, their heyday was the 90, late 90s through early mid 2000, well, late 2000s. And then, you know, Dan sold the group to Bill. They combined. It was a two act, two part show. Bill sold it off and the new equity group fired Dan. And there is no reason that that group shouldn't have been able to weather equity ownership. Right. Because the absolute business rock stars that were in that group and were made successful by the wisdom given by Bill and Dan, there was no reason that it shouldn't have stuck until you get inside of a room like Apex and you realize where the focus is and where it wasn't. Yeah. And the focus wasn't on being a friend, reaching out, pouring into other people, being vulnerable. The focus was on business growth, which that's the group it was. Yeah, absolutely. But when the fracture happened, it was as if somebody packed it with dynamite and blew it open. Yeah. It's you know? um, it's crazy when you get into the environments. You know, we had uh, MDM, uh, which you weren't at, right? That was graduation. It was graduation weekend, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, which I get 100%. I'm already worried about next year you know, what are dates going to be? Cause I was like, son, I'm going to miss your graduation. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. No, no, so you just got to like, you got to pray for a whole bunch of snow in Virginia beach, something so right. And they have snow days, so it pushes, pushes graduation back. So we're going to see, <clears> but you know, we, we took a bunch, we brought about 10 people out uh, this year and yep. um, it, it just, it was great. You've heard, you know, and, and it, it just, it was phenomenal. Um, we ended well, up that's, signing and, and up, just, gosh, like, I don't know how many damn people, but I, we're putting, by the end of the year, I think we'll have eight people in place from my team joining Apex. Yeah. Um, we brought out, I did kind now, of a that, giveaway, and we had two people that we did a giveaway, and then I brought them out to, to yeah. MDM. One of them just put in his notice at his job. He's going all in on his business, which he should nice. do. He's doing great, but he joined, you know, Apex. And it's, it, it's that, that personal feel, that impact that I'm just loving seeing that even though there were 2,000 some odd people at this event, individually, these people were touched, motivated, and are taking action mm -hmm. in, a, in a room with 2,500 some odd people. Yep. yep. That's not normal. Yep. It's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'm seeing it. Um, so a couple of things on what you shared there. Uh, I'll, I'll start where you ended on, on the action you're seeing. I, a couple guys are now in Apex, uh, Stu and Tyler. They're mattress guys. They're, they're, they swim in the ponds. I swim in. You know, I've talked to them in, in months past, years past, about working with them individually. Uh, it wasn't a right fit at the time. And I'm happy that they're in Apex now because I'm seeing them, I'm seeing them put the work in and do it. Yeah. And it's great. And, you know, maybe they stay mattress guys, maybe they discover something else. I don't know. We'll see. Yep. But like, it's awesome to see people join and then succeed. And, you know, the other thing, and again, I'm not trying to throw shade or be, you know, speak disparagingly about uh, Bill Glazer or Dan Kennedy. They're both people I consider mentors. I have a relationship with Dan Kennedy. Um, I was in his bedroom. Uh, <laughs> I'm the only Dan Kennedy member that gets to say that. Um, but, uh, but they built what they built very intentionally and that's fine. And their wealth I'm sure is, is far greater than mine. And that's great. However, um, 
I think legacy is important to all of us. And I know for a fact, both are disappointed in what ended up happening. Yeah. Um, and the gyrations it went through. Now, thankfully, because of the people they are, Russell Brunson bought up all the Kennedy IP mm. and had, cause Russell was a Dan student and then like, you know, skyrocketed to super success levels. Right. And so he felt it was important to bring that back into a proper fold and, and properly support it. So that's great. And that speaks to the lasting value, but those, those years, man, they were rocky years with those equity groups. Yeah. Cause they just, I mean, literally the one CEO I talked to, she thought they bought a publishing company because <laughs> it was newsletters and books. Yeah. She had no clue what she was buying. Wow. None. And when you look in Apex and you hear stories like you said, where you brought 10 people, I never, I've never seen that in any other room, any other kind of events, any other kind of sphere of influence. I've never seen that. I only see yeah. that in Apex. Yeah, it's wild. Um, talk about, so you joined last year, right? <clears throat> Yep. Yeah, it was well, uh, like late summer last year. Okay. Talk what had you looking for for something else, for something new? What was going on, you know, yep. business-wise that it was kind of like, "Hey, I need a I need an outlet." And you just knew it was something. I mean, it for me, I lit, and and maybe some people have said this it was irrational. Some people said have said this thought is psychopathic. Um I live with a fear that there's a mass conspiracy to take my time and profit away from me. And if I'm not constantly working to improve myself, that conspiracy will take over. Now, Ryan's better codified that as force of average. Yep, sure. Right? But that's my mantra, right? I've okay. been living with that for years. Yep. So I'm always looking for ways to improve. I mean, I'm part... You know, my co, my, I co-own Gardeners. I have an amazing business partner, Ben, uh, Ben McClure. I'm the visionary. He's the integrator. And we've had that since day one. That's awesome. And that dynamic has been a big, big part of our success. And um, for that reason, I drive the marketing in our business. It's why I was so involved in the Glazer Kennedy world. It's why I'm involved now in a, in a big copywriting group with one of the top copywriting guys of years of, of the last few decades. Okay. Um, you know, I hang around people who are experts in the things I want to get better at. Yeah. So apex for me was about getting better at leading myself. That's awesome. That's good. And how did you, how did you hear about apex and Ryan? A sales talk with sales pros. Okay. Yeah. Just a small group on Facebook. Yeah. Just like yeah. Couple, what was like 150,000 people or something like <laughs> yeah, that. One or two. <laughs> <laughs> ridiculous it's so insane um i see the shirt there signer 57 talk you want to talk yeah. a little bit about that yeah we can um you know it, it leans into the political side of things so i want to be respectful to your show ah, go for um, it. okay so <laughs> it, 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 and only the political side of things if you if you're the kind of person that wants to absolutely positively force your stuff on somebody else right so Signer 57 is, is a clothing brand, apparel brand that's got a real purpose and a belief behind it. So there were 50, everybody, well, most everybody recalls from school, you know, your school history class that there were 56 men that signed the Declaration of Independence. Those 56 men uh, in the 11 years from 1776, you know, we're going to celebrate our nation's birthday here on July 4th. There was 11 years till we got our constitution in 1787. In that 11 years time, those 56 men were, some were murdered by the crown, tortured by the crown, imprisoned, families imprisoned, uh, some families tortured, lands taken, wealth taken. Uh, some of the men realized this later years as, the, as we approach 1787 and the, you know, the, the war was, uh, the pendulum was swinging back and forth. There were times where they just burned their crops to the ground, burned their towns to the ground. They were like, well, we know you're going to take it because you're you're more well armed. You have more men, right? But you can have the pile of ashes. Uh, it was that sacrifice they so believed in what they wrote on July Fourth in 1776, signing the Declaration of Independence. They didn't know it at the time. For some, it was their death warrant. Hmm. They didn't know it, 
but they persevered on because they so believed in the ideals that then became our constitution. And I feel today we're approaching that level of tyranny. Um, we're approaching that, um, that precipice. And it's time to really ask people, would you sign knowing those sacrifices? We might need a 57th signer yeah. to push us back to where life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is the goal. And that is not pushed upon and foisted upon others. Um, you know, anecdotally, well, not anecdotally, it's anecdotal to you if you're outside of my town, sure. but it's, it's, it happened recently. So there's, there's, there's some guy, there's a guy, he publishes his own paper. It's very polarizing. I do not agree with any of his assertions and opinions. Um, but, you know, it's his right. I mean, you are in, in our nation, you are allowed free speech. Yep. And in my time, in your time, Josh, we've we've gone from Jewish attorneys representing Nazis at the ACLU to protect their right to free speech. Mm -hmm. We've gone in our time on this earth from that to now locally where I am, where a business was canceled because this gentleman wanted to host an event where it was simply the discussion was asking a question not saying I want it this way, saying, should it be this way? Yeah. Business canceled, one business partner forced to leave, um, you know, lives and lives in ruin of people that have built a business. People have lost their jobs. People quit their jobs because uh, they didn't agree. And, and again, all that's their right. But I'm just saying that's the pendulum. Yeah. In a short time. And to me, it's a very scary thing. And I just, the you know, Signer 57, something that I thought I would launch and it would challenge me in a number of ways because I've never focused like on e-commerce. That's never right. been my thing, um, but that's where it lives largely. And uh, so that's what the brand's about. Nice. Uh, just about really kind of planting your flag saying, you know what? I do believe in our constitution so much that I would be and will be willing to sacrifice in that same way. That's awesome. That's awesome. So talk to me a little bit about how you got into gardeners, like mm -hmm. where, I mean, cause I imagine in high school on the farm, you know, running around, you know, on dirt bikes and all this stuff. Yeah. The mindset wasn't, you know what? I'm going to sell the <laughs> shit out of some mattresses. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, maybe yeah, I'm wrong but, in that, but I'm going to go out right. on a limb and guess. Yeah. Well, I think, I think for the most part, like unless you're a rock star or an astronaut or a firefighter, you know, those, those things are, everybody does those things, right? Like, I mean, I think you could probably look at yourself and ask the same question. Like, yep. you know, was, was dog training? Like who, who says that? It's just kind of where, where life takes us. Yeah. So for me, the, the quick Genesis is, uh, tore my body up in my young years, worked in construction right out of high school and then realized I can't do this long term. So I got into sales, rose my career hockey stick, like right away. Um, cause I had the knowledge base, uh, grew up around that kind of stuff as well. And it, but it was big corporate company and got chewed up and spit out landed in the furniture and mattress industry on the wholesale side of things. Okay. And built a really great career, uh, ended up focusing more on bedroom. So bedroom furniture, kids for bunk beds, platform beds, mattresses, ended up developing a couple brands, ended up getting into sourcing, uh, really built a great career and still maintain some of that uh, influence in that, in that aspect. But sacrificed a lot for the family. Like I missed a lot of firsts with Ethan, my oldest boy, um, almost end of my marriage, you know, uh, 2000, I got married in 2002. January 2nd of 2003 to like April 15th, let's say, I spent 10 nights at home. Wow. And my wife was like, hey, this is not what I signed up for. Right. You know, we're, we're newlyweds here and I don't see you. Yeah. I don't know that I'm married. Uh, so it was that kind of a thing, that kind of a life. And I just decided enough was enough and uh, ended up buying, partnering into gardeners because they're a customer of mine. I knew my business partner as a customer. I could see the quality sure. uh, of who he was and just decided to get out of that rat race and uh, partnered in that way. 
That's to awesome. leverage the knowledge and skill and brought it into retail. Because I saw a lot of good retail. I saw a lot of bad retail. I saw a lot of ugly when I was servicing those dealers. So I knew, I knew what worked. I saw what worked. I saw what didn't. I saw how people operated. I kind of got the, you know, the Tommy boy thing, right? Put my head back at the back of the butcher's shop, put it up the bull's ass. And <laughs> you know, I got to see that, right? <laughs> so, um, so it was cool that way. And, uh, and I partnered into gardeners and we, I saw, saw I saw a good foundation and we, we just, we're blowing it up. That's awesome. Um, one of the statements you made a little earlier, um, I'd love if you expanded on it a little bit, because I don't think people, I think a lot of people get stuck in their business. Um, they fail to realize kind of where they are from a strength standpoint and, you know, what that, that marriage would look like if they had their counterpart, the right counterpart, you know, in their mm -hmm. business and that visionary and that integrator. And you spoke about yep. you very clearly being the visionary in your business. And yep. I think Ben, Ben's your partner. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Ben being that integrator and you yep. guys thrive, not without issue, I'm sure, but you thrive overwhelmingly um, knowing those are your guys's two roles and purposes yep. within the business. So kind of talk a little bit about, if you would, the importance of people figuring that out within their own industry. Um, in their own businesses, yeah. and they may not be either, right? Right. Yeah. There's all there's all kinds of other personality profiles that are out there. Um, yeah. I mean, it really is important to have a clear understanding of who you are, where your strengths are, and where your weaknesses are, and and be okay with those weaknesses. You know, um, like as an example, um, we do we do a community podcast show, Lancaster Connects. I believe we should give back to our community because the community, you know, I'm so grateful for our community because we're a very successful business. And that podcast is great. It's live streamed as well. It's an hour long. It's hyper focused on the community. I know we're doing good. I know it's paying off, but I know we're, we're getting a fraction of what we need. And to push that out, we want to micro dose some, sna some snapshots of the, of the one hour show do better for our charities, get more people attracted to it. Yeah. You know, Ben doesn't know how to do that. And he doesn't have time for that. I understand how to do it. I have the equipment to do it. But I loathe sitting in front of a computer click banging away the day. I, it's just not me. Right. And so, like I said, well, Ben is tapped out on time. I'm not going to do it. I might start and get a couple done and then I'm on to the next thing. So I ended up hiring actually through our friend, Justin Nelson at Sphere Rocket. We are now bringing on next week two VAs to basically, and I've always kind of said to myself, it'd be really cool if I had an entourage of people around me that could just take the, the baton I pick up and start running with and pick it up where I need to hand it off. Yeah. And it sounds like an arrogant thing to like say that, like have an entourage of people around you, but it's really like there is show me a successful person that hasn't had a team. Right. So how do you get there? Right. Most com companies can't or, or are not at a point. Can't's a powerful word. Shouldn't use it. They're not at a point where they can afford a CFO, a CMO, you know, five other C-suites. Right. But you can pull in a VA. You can pull in other people. You can delegate other tasks. You can challenge your team in the downtime. And in my business, retail, there's a ton of downtime. Uh, and my guys have a lot of different roles that they pull off when they're not working with a guest. Yeah. And um, so it, for me, it's really kind of that understanding of what you're really good at, what you can swing, um, you know, swing the hammer with, make hay with, and then shed everything else. Right. And, and really resist it. Like, just say, I'm not going to do that. Sure. And it's not from a position of arrogance or you're better than it. It's just, you are better at other things that make you money. hundred percent. And leverage and scale your time. Yeah. It's funny. You talked about, you know, you mentioned the, the entourage thing and um, you're like, Hey, I don't mean this arrogantly. I don't like, I, I shouldn't be doing certain things. And, and some people receive it that way. Um, so I understood the reason you were like, Hey, I don't yep. mean this from an arrogant standpoint, right. but I joke all the time, like the number of handlers 
and let's just let's really break it down. The number of nannies I actually need in my day to day life <laughs> is ridiculous. My wife yep. is a saint, um, and she we say all the time she is the CEO of Team Wilson. You know, mm-hmm. she she runs everything regarding yep. personal life, the family, you know, the household. I mean, she is the champion there, and and I do, I stay out of the way. You know, if I try to poke my nose in, I'm surely going to screw it up. And so I let her run with it. That is her business. That is her deal. And she does it very, very well at a high level. And that allows me to, in turn, be focused and dialed in on our businesses and do what only I can do. And she'll be as involved in the business as I need her to be. But she's not digging around, poking around, all that stuff. Now, once I get to work, I probably need like 60 people like to, to do all the things I'm just garbage at and I'm terrible at. And, you know, I am, I actually just did the, the visionary integrator Mm -hmm. quiz that Thomas had spoken about. And I knew I didn't have to take it. Like I knew where it was going to fall and it was crazy high visionary, but we always want to know the score. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I wanted a high (laughs) score and it was a high score and I was surprised myself because I was a little higher on the integrator piece than I expected. Uh, yeah, me too. I, was I haven't been yep. a, I haven't spent much time professionally as an employee. Uh, when I have though, I was a number two mm-hmm. and I think I was a damn good number two. The problem for me always was my mind was wonder, wandering to doing my own thing not in competition with what I was doing as a number two, but just like, Oh, you know, that that entrepreneurial piece was always tugging at me. So it didn't make me a, a long-term good employee. But when I was a number two, I was a damn good number two. If I believed in you, if I believed in you, I believed in the vision. I believed in the mission, man, tell me what we're doing and I'm going to tell me where you want to go and I'll figure it out. Yep. But where I thrive and where I'm happiest is when there's the ideas, when there's global type problem solving. Mm -hmm. And it's like, this is the way you see that light. You see that in the distance, that's where we need to go. And I know it a hundred percent. And then Katie, who is our integrator, my COO, she's like, got it. And she'll figure out all the, the little intricacies and the tweaks with the staff and things that need to change. Because if I'm left to do that, we're in a yeah, bad it doesn't way. happen. We're in a yeah, bad way. Absolutely. And it's almost like because I hate those things so much, you know, I I almost avoid it. I'll self-sabotage it because I just don't want to do it. Yep. It's not that I can't, I just don't want to. Yep. And I want to stay focused on big picture stuff. I want to stay focused on things that that um add an, a ridiculous amount of value that I don't even realize yet. Um, you know, like I get so fired up and motivated by we probably have six, 700 dogs right now in training at any wow. given time, probably six or 700 dogs, not here in, in Virginia alone, but across our locations. Yeah. And that's yep. really motivating to me. That makes me so happy. What makes me more excited though, and don't hate me, all my dog listeners and stuff, but one person's going to take something out of this conversation between Jeff and I today. That's going to change the trajectory of their life. I don't know what it is. You never know. Yep. You never know. But there's going to be one person who hears something today that's said, and it's going to make a big impact in their life. And that motivates me, the unknown of it, but knowing that it can happen, it yep. motivates me to do these things and that bigger picture stuff. And I'm confident in what we've put in place within the, the dog business, particularly where I've been very fortunate to to find good people to come in and integrate these systems and processes and their passion for the dogs and doing the right things. Their integrity is at the same level as mine. And so they can do the things, but I know for our business, my hands being on a leash isn't the best use of my time anymore. Right. right. Doesn't yeah. mean there's not days I'd prefer to be doing that, but hundred percent agree. Just yeah, I mean, I have, I, I take that, I, I follow that same path. Uh, I, I take it to the nth degree. I'll give you a couple examples. One of them is I have vendors that email me updates on product, merchandise, and pricing. And I just say, 
I, I don't need this. Yeah. Our, we have, we have procedures in place. My team knows what we need to do with price increases. My team knows what the plan is when we need to re-merchandise something or our models discontinued. Like, I don't need, I don't need this on my email. Don't send it to me thinking I'm going to do your job for you. It needs right. to go to my team. And I remind them like, Hey, on your paperwork, when we set up an account, I, and I do all that because I set up the pathway, like go back to your paper and follow what I gave you. Yeah. Get your house in order. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, uh, so, um, uh, that's one way. Um, another way is I often have people say to me, um, locally, Hey, Jeff, when can I come to the store? I want to, I want to get a mattress from you. I want to work with you. And I say, well, here's how that works. You've right now, you've got Thursday afternoon from two to four to come in. Yeah. And that's the only time I'm available for things like that. And some people get indignant, they get upset. And I say, wait a minute. I don't run my business to like sell mattresses. I run my business to be the very best sleep shop in the region. Yeah. My team is actually better at helping you. They they know the products inside and out. I establish yeah. relationships with amazing partners and we build the product, but they know it inside and out. They know how to address your issues better than I do. Yeah. And probably you you'd say the same thing. Your trainers I mean, you're a good dog trainer. I'm a good mattress guy, but I'd imagine your team, because it's their core focus, it's their number one common objective every day is to train dogs. 100%. So like with people say, I want you to train my dog, Josh, like that probably doesn't work in your world. No, it, it doesn't. And they don't want me to. Right. You know, my, right. my goal, I've said this for years, is I want to be the worst dog trainer on my team. Yep. The day that I'm yep. the worst dog trainer on my team, I don't know that there's other dog trainer companies in business. Like it, it, right. it, I'm not God's gift to, to the dog world by any means. I'm a good dog trainer. My work ethic, my passion, you know, it, what I'm willing to do time wise and energy wise, you know, with the dogs, I will outwork the vast majority of people um, yep. in a way that's beneficial for that animal. But am I God's gift? No, absolutely not. So I probably 75% of my team is, is better dog trainer than I am. Yep. And that's great. That's what it should be though, because tactically they're doing it day in and day out, day in and day out. I haven't taken a dog start to finish in years. And people are like, Oh, well, you're not really a dog trainer. I'm like, oh, okay. All right. Yeah. You're, you're well, right. Maybe, maybe I'm not, but the thing is I've created opportunities for right. hundreds of people to change their lives, find a, a career path that they never knew existed for most of them. Um, and if I was still the only person training dogs, I'd be training a fraction of the dogs and helping impact the families. You'd have a fraction of the impact. Yep. Then, then we would. And it, that's what it's I mean, about. It's about the dogs and the families. What you do is literal life and death for animals. And, and what I mean by that is yeah. if your company isn't amazing helping six or 700 dogs, you know, the 80 20 rule is going to say that 20% of those dogs are going to fail to some degree in the home. Okay. So that's 120 dogs. Yep. Another 20% of those dogs are going to go back to the shelter because the family just can't handle it. The rest of those dogs, so like, you know, about 100 of those dogs are going to maybe be rehomed and, and be yep. okay. But the rest of those dogs, the 20, 24 or so, are going to go back to a shelter and the likelihood that because they failed and now they're stressed out, anxious, all this stuff, they'll be euthanized. It's literal life and death, what you do for animals. Yeah. I appreciate that. And I agree with you. It's, 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 it's nuts. And it wasn't anything that, you know, we envisioned back in right. 2013 when we started this. Um, but it's, I find so much joy in teaching people how to do what only I was doing. Right. And know that right. more dogs are helped, more families are helped, less stress is in the house. And you're yeah. big in the rescue world, right? I mean, oh, that's yeah. an important thing to you, yeah. dogs and, and dog and yeah. rescue and stuff. And, you know, maybe as we, as we, as we wrap up, cause I want to honor your time and our listeners talk a little bit about, you know, your, um, you know, your love for dogs and, and passion yeah. there, as far as the yep. rescue goes. I mean, I, there's some cool stories there. Yeah. I mean, you can, you know, 
we've always uh, liked to foster. Um, we've we've been the dog walk ambassadors at our rescues over the years, but uh, we often have a third crate in our house. We have two dogs, Gizmo and Zeus, which are pit bulls. We love them. Uh, and uh, but we've often had a third crate where we'll bring in a dog, uh, we'll bring in older dogs, problem dogs, um, and just give them a home, give them love, give them time. Um, to where they're not spending those last days in the shelter or yeah. bouncing around all over the place. Um, my biggest uh, success would be probably Guy. Guy was like just a wired up pit bull, just, you know, he was bouncing around shelter to shelter and we got him calmed down and got him into a permanent home. So that was cool. And then our biggest failure was Xena. She was a pit bull. She had a lot of problems. And we finally got her into a home and Josh, you'll, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, I gave the family the whole, the whole, for what the first week looked like. And I had a document typed up that I yeah. do for every dog, but I'm like, here's what the first week or two looks like. And you have to follow this. And, and the dog is probably going to show you love in ways that you think you can not follow this schedule, but you have to follow it. Yeah. Cause they can trick you. And so within four or five hours, I, we, we did the, the, the drop off at like noon by four or five that night, that evening afternoon, I'm getting photos from the family of the dog on the couch with the toddler. The toddler's got food and in our house, we feed separately. Right. Like, so that's how, and I tell them that like, you need to crate feed this dog and, um, and then work through it on your own through time. But I was getting all the wrong pictures sent to me. I'm like, hey, this is all great. You know, they said, uh, the thought that you said Zena doesn't like playing with toys. She's playing with toys in the backyard with the other dog. I'm like, okay, that's week three, week four stuff. Get right. back to the yeah. schedule. Yeah. And wouldn't you know it, the next morning, they're out playing. They come in, both dogs come in. And Zena decides, this is my territory. This yep. is my house. And she gets into it with the other dog. The toddler gets bit because the toddler was right there. Hey. Well, that was it. They can't, they can't put that dog out anymore. Right. Yep. And uh, I bawled my eyes out when they put Zena to sleep. Yep. It's terrible because I felt like I let her down. But at the end of it, I didn't do anything to let her down. It was, the, right. it was that other family that did. And yeah, it's hard. It's super hard. Oh, it's That's heartbreaking. That we see, you know, often and you know dogs will come into us particularly the last couple of years you know mid 2020 we were calling them the covid puppies mm -hmm. and now we're getting just the straight covid dogs and the lack of socialization the lack yep. of confidence um the lack of environmental work that was done with these dogs you know we've got dogs that never left their house the first year of their life and yep. you know now all of a sudden people are starting to go places again or have people over the last you know six to nine months and Josh, I don't understand. My dog is aggressive. My dog is lunging at everybody. <laughs> my dog is trying to kill every dog it sees. My dog is, you know, biting my 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 cousins when they come over. I just don't get it. I'm like, imagine you spent a, a first year, year half of your life in a box. Yep. And now all of a sudden I drop you off in the middle of Disney World. Who's yep. feeling super comfortable? Nobody. Right. right. Nobody. And so these dogs that we're seeing that we're having to build up. And, you know, I tell people, uh, people with puppies get so hung up on the puppies, like pulling on the leash and not jumping on them and, you know, not sitting and waiting for their food and all this crap. I'm like, look, did your, did your toddler like wipe its own ass? Like, no, it, it mm -hmm. didn't. Like, these are things. <laughs> what I'm not worried about your dog coming into training at five, six months old, being right. crappy at obedience. Okay. Right. That doesn't bother me. What I want you doing is forget trying to teach sit. Take the dog out and about, put it right. on different surfaces, have it around different people and different dogs and textures and noises. Bring me the, the worst behaved, confident, bold puppy, and we will make that dog phenomenal. But you yep. bring me a six, seven month old dog who's never left the backyard, but he knows what sit means if you have the right treat, but he's terrified of the world. You can't fix terrified of the world. Because right. those first, you know, six, seven months are so important from a development standpoint. Once they're yep. gone, they're gone. Yep. And well, I, you can build up a little bit, but yeah, you know, not a lot you can do. 
Yeah. I, I have, um, our two boys and they both respond to new people like at the campsite does an example they both respond to new people walking by in their own way they both they both are on guard they're both looking they're both watching gizmo you'd think he doesn't have a care in the world right zeus you think he's ready to tear your head off um but he has that he has that growly verbal disposition right and all he's doing is just saying hey i'm a dog i'm here this is my spot and you know just know that and i tell people walking by like because i you know i'm like hey we engage and say hi i'm friendly to everybody i want to know who my neighbors are and i certainly want to know who my neighbors are if they're new about right. their dog our dog and like hey you know so zeus is a little mouthy he gets a little loud but if we if you want to do a meet and greet so you can walk comfortably by and not think that zeus is going to be upset about it let's just meet over here in neutral territory sure and not, and it's five minutes and that's it. And every time I've done that, it's worked. Yep. And they understand, and like even dog people, like, well, you know, dog people don't know dogs, but um, like then they get it and then yep. everybody's happy and we all get along. So being intentional yeah. structure is important mm -hmm. and, and that's yep. a big deal. Well, look, Jeff, I appreciate you, man. This has been a lot yep. of fun. I've loved, you know, learning more about you and I know that the, the listeners are as well. What's the best way for people to connect with you and, and learn more about you. Yep. I'm not going to make you learn how to say or spell Janakovo. Just go to the Jeff And that's got all the links for all the things I'm involved in. If you want to connect with me just socially on Facebook, do that. All the links are there real simple. It's kind of like choose your own adventure books. <laughs> that's awesome, man. Hey, you're going to be in Dallas next week. I am. All right. Yeehaw, well, look, forward man. To, look forward to hugging your neck then, man. I'll see yep. you soon. And I can't thank you enough for coming on. It's been a blast. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Take care.